Are you happy to be here? <laughs> here, together. It's something special. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know Wait a minute. In Iceland, they were all singing. You're supposed to be singing too, because I want this group to rank up with them. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Well, they did the foot, foot stomp version too, but I, I, they had me paired with a op real opera singer, so it made it all together easier. I have got a 40-minute talk to be given in 20 minutes, and so I'll skip out all the compliments I was going to give to all my friends. I have never been in a group that had so many of my mentors and colleagues all drawn together in a meeting, despite, you know, COVID, no COVID, even before, that never happened. I, I've shared uh, papers and platforms with uh, all of you, a good chunk of you, uh, many times and enjoyed them. And so this is my potted history, but even looking around the room, I realized the potted history is not much good because it's, it's missed out too many of you. And I see a Lois thing. I didn't, I missed the Frame Stutzer book in here. There are so many things that have been missed. Uh, but the two Andrews have already had the, the appropriate nod for important contributors. And of course, Andy's, uh, 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 Danny's book on the foundations of hedonic psychology, all safely in the previous century. Uh, now, inter getting more interdisciplinary, I put in Oxford 2001 because that's where I wrote the paper that was my introduction to the field as a, a research assistant for Aristotle. It was inherently interdisciplinary. Uh, but that paper then allowed me to meet the two Andrews, who both were then mentors and friends in trying to get that paper in shape before I actually uh, uh, put it out. And then it led to me being recognized or seen uh, by both Gallup and by Danny and by Richard. Because uh, Richard then uh, had Danny and me and other people later to a meeting about his next book. And so it, through these networks, you, uh, you get at meeting a whole lot of people and developing your own ideas. Uh, but when I'm, I'm trying to show how this is the research day, not the policy day, but they're intrinsically related because you can't do the research unless you have good data. You can't get the good data unless somebody thinks it's important. Typically, that's not until policymakers think it's important or somebody thinks they should think it was important. So that uh, the story of the World Happiness Report, which is in some sense what I'm building up to, really required a confluence of several positive things. One, there had to have been a science extant and worth talking about and with reasonable things to offer at the time you take it seriously. There had to be a very good database or else you're not going to be able to do the empirics for a world happiness report. Secondly, you had to have a platform. You had to have a way, an interest. And of course that required some deep contributions on the governmental side, and that was a magical combination of the government of Bhutan and Jeffrey Sachs, if you like, because the government of Bhutan had been holding these uh, gross national happiness conferences since early in the century, and I'd been lucky enough through also that same paper, I guess, of being involved in the several of those, so I knew all the players on that side. Uh, and then uh, Jeffrey managed to get that resolution in June of 2011 before the General Assembly passed MEMCON, and then that led to the meeting in Timpu later that summer where plans were being made for the April 2012 high-level meeting at the United Nations. And so it was Jeffrey's idea, and Richard and I agreed to play along, um, that we should have a report of the science to present before that meeting. And uh, I think Danny was at the seminar we held adjacent to that uh, launch, uh, and maybe some of the rest of you as well. But it surpassed all our expectations in a sense of the interest. We'd always thought the reason people took GDP so seriously and not happiness is that that's what we were fed in all the media. And uh, so the question is, 
Was there some other alternative source of information about something better worth focusing on? And that was the intent, of course, of that resolution uh, for governments, and it was also uh, the intent of the report to help build that science. So I've taken you through all of that. Now, uh, Danny keeps reappearing in all these things because he's a towering figure in so many ways. Um, but it was his idea, he invited Ed, if I remember this right, it, Danny invited Ed and me to join him in, in editing this volume, International Differences in Well-Being, that then we had chapters from a number of people in this room, uh, and there was a conference at Princeton in, the, in 2008, in uh, October, I guess it was. And here are some, as I remember, some of the issues uh, discussed at that conference. Uh, in the end, in the introduction to the book, we said, well, it should be a, a subjective well-being. But in fact, when it came to later the World Happiness Report, how many people would have read it? It was called the World Well-Being Report. Not very many. And uh, so it, it was true at that conference, there were people who were writing books on happiness, and they called them happiness. Uh, they said, you can call your book whatever you want, but uh, happiness is what I'm going to call my book because it has a convening power. Uh, and that remains the case. Uh, and then, of course, people, when we did pick it up for the World Happiness Report to call it happiness, uh, they said, well, there's inherent ambiguity there. Some people said it's just all fluff because this is just positive emotions, not what life is about. It says you want a good life, an important life, a purposeful life. And so we picked up the philosophical point that uh, Amartya Sen uh, traces to Gramsci and I trace uh, to Grice, uh, that in fact there are two ways of using the, the word happiness. One is, how happy are you? This is like in the Gallup question, how happy are you yesterday? It's the question I asked you when I was asking you to sing and answer. The second way is how happy are you about something? And so, to take uh, Danny's distinction of living life and thinking about it, living life is how happy are you now, thinking about it is how happy are you with your life as a whole? And it turns out, putting a life evaluation question that way gives you almost structurally identical answers to satisfaction with life or the Cantrell ladder. Uh, and so we get, yeah, let me skip to the income point first. At that conference, you'll remember, Danny, you and Ed had a chapter that said the Cantrell ladder gave bigger income effects than does life satisfaction. And that was because it has a relativity built into it. That was the hypothesis. Well, you know me, I'm a numbers person. So I man we managed to persuade Gallup to put in the satisfaction with life question in a survey, so, which is the only way to do it, right? You've got the same people in the same con survey context, and you ask both questions. And it turns out the income effects are identical with those two uh, measures. And so uh, right in the compass of that same book, we raised a hypothesis and produced the evidence, and uh, I hope put that one behind us. Uh, binary answers and longer scales, uh, I've only I've always been a long scale person, um, and so yes, no, it just doesn't have enough information in it. As we've increasingly focused on inequality, then the importance of the longer scales increases because you can get meaningful distribution shape differences with a zero to 10 scale. Zero, one has nothing in it. So now we would like to trace the evolution of changes in the inequality of well-being distributions in terms of the inequality of the source variable. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Uh, so anyway, longer, longer wins on that one. Uh, affect balances, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you where we're going on that one. Uh, so this is the three things that uh, Ed really sort of had this binary split, tr triple split, and that's the same one that's in the Cantrell ladder. Uh, uh, and of course, the life evaluations is what we concentrate on. I'll tell you why. You know what the Cantrell, this is all people who know all this stuff. And so this is the, uh, the Cantrell ladder top and bottom. And increasingly, we're presenting our first picture this way, because when we present the figure the way it usually is in the report, 
three quarters of the world's press think we are ranking countries on the basis of those six factors. Well, as you know, that's obviously not the case and that's not what we do. So we have to be careful because it's very important to us that it's not our index of anything that we're ranking countries on. It's their expressions of their own life evaluations. So, uh, why do we use life evaluations? Well, they're a single umbrella measure. Uh, which is critically important, so it then says purpose in life, very important, but it's a right-hand side variable, not a left-hand side. I'm following straight from the Aristotle's pre-registered hypotheses that I was originally testing in 2001. I'm not making it up. And positive and negative emotions, also very import important effects on an overall life evaluation, but they're not an alternative to those. They're, in fact, part of the, what goes into the sausage. And of course, once you have a, a variable directly measured, as opposed to a combination of other variables, you can use it to explain the relative importance of the other variables. Well, that's absolutely critical for the kind of cost-benefit analysis that Gus and, and Richard and others have been doing. You have to have some compensating differentials. In order to get those, you have, and many of you have done this stuff, of course. Uh, and, of course, it's very important to, to get a good primary measure as you then find it easier to look at the actual levels. And it's not just for countries. It's subgroups of the population. It's anything. You can then say, how different are they? You've got these measures. You've got sample sizes you know. You can then test for significance of the differences. And, of course, the cost-benefit analysis I've already talked about. And the inequality. I already talked about that. It's a good thing, too, because I'm down to how many minutes? So I'm going to skip right through this because you know the World Happiness Report, so you know the way it's set up. Okay. Oh, boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> all right. So the key points I wanted to make <laughs> were, first of all, the importance of measuring positives. When the Lloyd's Register Foundation had a world risk poll, they asked for some help and said, what kind of questions do we do? And I said, these are all negative risks. Why don't you talk about some positive risks. Why don't something, pos chances of something positive happening? So we persuaded them to put the wallet question in. If you lost your wallet with something valuable in it, how likely is it to be returned, if found by a stranger or a police officer? And so now we formed, framed the question so they were on the same scale. Very likely that you'll have uh, harm from mental health issues, very likely harm from, men from uh, uh, violent crime, very likely return of a wallet found by police, very likely if found uh, by a, a stranger. Sorry, a police and neighbor we've got here. There's strangers in there too. They're all in there together, so they aren't, these are, they're competing for explanatory power. To think that either a, a, a stranger or a neighbor would return your wallet, either would return, both I mean, would return your wallet, it has the well-being equivalent of all of those things put together, current unemployment uh, and then those positive measures. And you see, you can compare it to a doubling of income. So I see really important, if they hadn't included those measures of positive risk, everything would have been about all the damages to well-being from these negative things. Unless you actually specify the positive possibilities and measure them, you'll never be able to do the science to convince somebody that it's a mistake to just look at what's going wrong and try and solve that rather than looking about what's going right and try to make it happen. All right, this is uh, the, the lost wallet question uh, is actually had some real experiments behind it. So for 40 countries, uh, we know uh, the actual Cantler ladder scores, blue, the wallets actually returned per 10 lost in red, and the number expected. So this comes, this comes from our surveys, uh, the, the, and this comes from the Cohen et al. experiments, and this is the latter. Well, you can see how important, uh, I just divided, re, oh. have you got that? Have you absorbed it all? I'll send it to you later if you want to ask a question about it, and I'm gonna skip through the migration, because I want to give you at least a flavor of the COVID stuff. 
win equality, people much happier. We took all Europeans and gave them Nordic levels, individual ESS data gave them Nordic levels of uh, trust and personal connections. You see how it shifted the old distribution, pulled in the left tail, moved the mean, but more important than moving the mean was the reduction uh, in inequality. All right, uh, so this is overall eliminators. Uh, and this is COVID deaths, but let me take you to the next one because I'm just about disappearing on you. Uh, let me back up. So you see what trust does. Nordic excluding Sweden, Sweden and the other Western Europe, now Sweden had a, had, a, had a really open policy and you can see how it matters. They've got the same social context and all the same kind of quality healthcare system, just made a mistake. You can see the difference in terms of both measured excess deaths for 20 and 21, as well as registered uh, COVID deaths. I'm heading backwards. I think I'm gonna be 30 seconds ahead and open the, for questions, because I know I haven't answered all your questions, and now I have 10 minutes to try. Over to you. You be, be warned, if you don't. <laughs> At this stage, applause is a waste of time. Let's get on with the questions. And if you don't have questions, I'll start talking again, and that's always bad, yes. Uh, uh, in broad terms, the social context. Then you say which aspects of the social context. Different surveys measure these things different ways. But that wallet thing is rather nice because it, you, you could see how important it was. It isn't in our basic modeling because we only have it for one year in the Gallup poll. Um, but some feeling that you are in a community where other people watch your back and would help you. One part that even Aristotle didn't pick up on as much as human nature demands that he should is the extent to which feeling that other people want to do things for you is important and that you get well-being out of doing things for other people with other people, for other people. So that's a, we found a continual increase in the power of pro-social activity, both in terms of what it does for the giver and what it does uh, for the receiver. But, you know, somebody really close to help you. All life is local, so it matters most in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in, in, in who you know, but it's equally true for the society. So we find trust in the overall institutional systems is independently important to your trust of the people who are going to find your wallet and return it. The Nordic stuff on the wallets is very relevant, right? Because a lot of people say oh, it's just because they have great social safety nets. Well, social safety nets don't return your wallet. Other people return your wallet. Yes? I feel like there's not enough research. Uh, not enough research done on physical exercise. Um, and so I know it's reverse causal. Uh, but I think especially during the pandemic, right, we see how important it is. Yeah. You know, why is that missing? Why is it missing? From the research. Why is it? Well, because the data don't have it for the global research. Remember this session, my talks about world happiness. So we're stuck in a way to talk about things that we can get reasonable world measures of. It's, it's, there are lots of excellent studies about physical activity is great. Physical activity done in concert with others is even greater. And uh, so that's where the social com context does come back. So from all these time use surveys, but more importantly now these mappiness uh, data, because you know who they're with as well as what they're doing moment by moment. And who you're with is much more important than what you're doing. But given you can be with a friend, uh, to be outdoors in physical activity is right up there. So there's evidence, but it doesn't get into my world thing because I don't have the data. It's not because it isn't important. Over here. 
want to ask a, quite a basic philosophical question. So you, you distinguish between happiness with and happiness during. So sense of satisfaction with life and then actually how you feel. Yeah. And you went for the, the satisfaction with life version. And I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, why you prioritize that one. Because you said, well, look, you could explain how, you, how happy you feel. Uh, that, that can explain your life satisfaction. Yeah. But that can go the other way around as well. And one way I think about it is that if we encounter someone who is in agony and we ask what's bad about their agony, it seems what's bad about their agony is their suffering. It's how it makes them feel, yeah. what's, rather than the fact it makes them less satisfied with their life. Yeah. So I wonder why you, why you take satisfaction rather than happiness to be the thing which, uh, oh. in the end, is, is what matters most. I mean, I, 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 I was testing a pre-registered hypothesis straight, straight out from Aristotle and he said it was these positive feelings, in fact, do support a, a greater sense of leading a good life. Uh, and we also find, if you treat, for example, uh, positive affect and life satisfaction as alternative dependent variables, the fit is very much tighter if you go for life satisfaction. We then put the positive emotions in, and they get a really big effect and they cut down the coefficients, just the ones you'd expect they to cut down. So the social a actions ones, the kind, because we know they give you joy, and we know they give you life satisfaction, a good part of that life satisfaction is flowing through the emotions. So it plays all the, the joys, the current emotions, both positive and negative, play these mediating roles between what life is delivering to you and how you're feeling about your life as a consequence. So I, the causal direction to me is pretty clear. All these things, as you well know, these correlational studies, the causal arrows on most of these things go both directions in a circular flank. Goodness for that, because if good things didn't build good things, then we wouldn't spend as much time trying to create them. Yes, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, we know a lot about happiness and life satisfaction. What are the biggest things we don't know? What are the most important questions we still puzzle over or need to find out going forward? Now, you're, you're asking from the point of view of a statistical agency? Uh, research. Oh, research. Well, re researchers, us guys, we're dependent on what the statistical agencies give us. That was so wonderful about the launch by uh, 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 Gus and, and the NSO and the Prime Minister in November of 2010. They said, this has got to be a team effort. If we don't have the data, we won't be able to do anything. Uh, so now we want to dig in much more. You see, Gallup is 1,000 people per year per country. You can't do anything with that in terms of really understanding what's going on. So the next step is to get linked and at least consistent national statistical agency collections that allow you to drill down by population subgroups and geographic subregions in order to figure out where is life good and where is it bad, and then it helps you to understand both context and individual circumstances and explaining it. We're just way up there. And a lot of the early models were just looking at as treating as these effect, these influences so they were additively independent. Well, of course they're not. So 2.0 is saying, well, let's see where the interactions are important and why they're important. So it's very early days, and, but it's important to get enough feedback uh, to the policymakers and, and their statistical agencies that they're thinking it isn't over just to have a big four in a survey or two. You've got to have the key measures in all your surveys. It should be just like, you know, the basic age, education, gender. You should have subjective well-being in, in there. So we're long, and give us that and we can start telling you things that are interesting. Uh, here, final question. I'm so sorry. I talk too much. Just interested in the, you talked about examples of measuring trust. What are the measures you're using for social connection? Oh, there are lots of them. In the Gallup poll, it's do you have someone to count in times of trouble? Yes, no. Well, we know from the European Social Survey there are any number of ways of digging into that more. How many? How frequent have you had this support? What kind of support? Family, friends, and so on. So, jury, so there are dose response relationships for all of those. And so basically every kind of connection we look at, there's a dose-response relationship. Well, there's a peak in the family one in some cases. <laughs> you can imagine why that is. That was the last question we had time for. What? One more question. Good. I, I cut myself off. Next. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering from policy point of view, 
what kind of role the World Happiness Report can play in influencing the uh, global agenda? For example, given that sustainable development goals will end in 2030, and the global community is now looking for what's going to be the next big agenda for post-SDGs after 2030. So I'm just wondering the role of World Happiness Report can play. Well, we've been very surprised at how widespread the distribution and take up of the World Happiness Report has been. For the SDSN, it overshadows all their other publications put together. And what that has done, the number one thing it's done in terms of behavior and the way governments think about things, is that it's changed the focus of attention to the Nordic countries because they're all, all five of them are almost always in the top ten. So now you find in all those countries and other countries, you see they're saying, just like high PISA scores drove everyone to Finland to find out about their school system, well, the Finnish educators are smarter than most others, so they've discovered the, the education is more than about test scores. And in a sense, we're now saying, uh, people are now saying, what is it to see? And so some of this is coming out of the country. Of course, the first thing they'll say is, we're not happy. And that tells you one of the reasons why they're happy is because they're not about to boast about anything. Um, and and then, you, then you take through what they say about their life and you say, well, if that doesn't justify a high life satisfaction answer, I don't know what would. So they're very high. Well, you saw the wallet return peak. Uh, and so people notice that. And that's a relevant policy thing for all countries to say, we have to build social connection. The countries that have it work better than the ones that don't. Uh, and so if you're thinking of the policy agenda, I think that's where they're now. It's not what you're delivering to people, it's how you're enabling people to do things with and for each other. Reversal of the whole thing it doesn't come top down, it comes bottom up. So you're enabling patients to help patients, you're helping unemployed to help unemployed. You're, ha you're, you're really creating the capacity to generate better lives, or helping to create it, uh, right across the board. And it's, so it's that, so everybody can have this sense of freedom and engagement and so on. It's a big, it's changing the agenda from repairing something bad by a medicine that gets rid of the anxiety but cuts off your willingness and ability to generate something better. It's the generation of something better in all these phases, whether it's employment or health and so on. I've gone on too long with my last question. I knew I would. Thank you very much. <laughs>